The who are SJSU lecturer Jack Estill hosted a student debate during the last meeting of his Austrian economics class. The debate was held between two teams arguing for and against a universal healthcare system. Three SJSU economics lecturers oversaw the debate and judged which students offered the best performances. Hello everybody, my name is Taryn. As leader for the affirmative, I will be arguing for the implement implementation of a universal healthcare system. A system that would be allowing for all citizens of the United States to get healthcare through a single payer system. By a single payer system, I mean a dual private public system where the government would pay for over 50% of the healthcare, with the remainder being paid by private insurance, much like France does. And according to the World Health, or World Health Organization, France is number one in health. Where is the US, you ask? They rank 37th out of 190. You may be saying, that's not too bad, but we have to keep in mind that the rest of the nations below them are relatively underdeveloped and that the United States you would think would be doing better. The countries in front of the US include Canada, Germany, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, Japan, Norway, and Spain. What do they all have in common they all have a nationwide healthcare system, and each and, each and every one of these countries pays less in healthcare per capita than the United States. The World Bank Data Center from 2015 shows that the United States pays $9,403 per capita, while Canada pays $5,292, Germany pays $5,411, France pays $4,959, and Italy pays $3,258. Furthermore, the World Bank shows that these same countries also have higher life expectancy rates than the U.S. Japan with the highest of 84 years, Spain with 83 years, and the rest are between 81 and 82 years. The United States rests at 79 years. So while the United States is one of the most advanced societies in the world, it lacks in providing efficient, high-quality health care for all of its citizens and residents that reside here. I see you have a question. I'll get back to you at the end. <laughs> Today, there are over 40 million Americans who are uninsured due to the high cost of private insurance and the fact that many are the working poor or unemployed. Furthermore, of people who do have medical insurance, it's still possible they may end up, may end up filing bankruptcy. In fact, 67% of all bankruptcies in 2007 were related to health insurance. A healthcare reform system would provide numerous benefits to the nation, number one being savings. According to the Physicians for National Health Program, a single-payer system would lower administrative and prescription costs by $592 billion and up to $1.8 trillion in a decade. These savings could provide care for all of the 40 million uninsured and more. The American Health Asso Association states that the private health insurance plans spend 11. 7% of premiums on administrative costs versus 6.3% by public health programs. To put it in further perspective, the administrative costs the U.S. face, the PNHP, the same organization, stated last month that for every dollar spent on health care, 31 cents is spent purely on administrative duties. A study by the Becker's Hospital Review Board reviewed the United States and eight other countries, and researchers analyzed data from Canada, England, Scotland, Wales, France, and Germany. Oh, sorry, the Netherlands and the US. Administrative costs made up 25.3% of total hospital spending in the United States. Change must happen, and while the affirmative understands that a single payer system does mean tax increases, keep in, mind, keep in mind that we're looking at the long run of our nation. Of course, it's gonna be hurtful in the, in the short run. Our current system does not work that's why we are here debating this right now. Now maybe the opposition is going to ask for deregulation of our health system. My question is this, will deregulation really solve our problems? Will it stop insurance companies from crippling our brothers and sisters with high insurance premiums? And will it allow for the millions who desperately need healthcare to get it? Thank you very much. Oh, oh. oh yes, you sir, what's your question? So in, in my research, I found that the increase in prices for health insurance uh, paid by members or citizens of the United States is also correlated with the higher levels of technology provided by U.S. healthcare systems. 
So although the United States may be paying more for their health care, uh, we are receiving better levels of technology than those with universalized health care system. Is there anything in your data that suggests that um, perhaps these more technology, technologically advanced procedures uh, account for a larger percentage of that uh, per capita expenditure on healthcare than maybe just insurance premiums? Well, first I would like to know exactly where you say your research comes from. Do you have a specific organization in mind that it comes from? Um, this comes from the, the Open Watch Group in Britain. Open Watch Group in Britain. And they're watching specifically the, the markets between the United States and more specifically the healthcare systems in Britain where they're moving back towards a semi-privatized system as you have said is a good idea, but they're moving away from a universalized healthcare system to a semi-privatized because they found that their universal healthcare system is not bringing new technologies and new treatments to their patients. Hmm, interesting. Well, you know, I would definitely hesitate to draw a complete conclusion about why they exactly would be falling away from a universal system. I'm sure that, you know, there are various differences between our nation. But at the same time, you say that because we are more a technologically advanced nation, that we should also be able to be more efficient with the use of the technology, thus being able to provide lower health care for it. But at the same time, I don't think it really is a technological problem of why our costs are so much. Uh, I really think it's the politics behind it. And then the fact that our nation, a lot of the costs come from the pull that the two giant industries that we have which is the prescription manufacture, the drug manufacturing uh, industry and the device manufacturing industry. I believe that those two really have the real sway of why we have so much uh, higher uh, increase per capita for healthcare. I hesitate to actually draw a conclusion of why, if it's actually from more technological advance, I think that those two industries are really why the reasons why we have higher costs. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. So thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen, uh, judges and those that are judged. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, the socialist calculation debate happened about 100 years ago. And 100 years ago, Mises argued that government intervention in markets created a false sense of control and in turn led towards tyranny. Today, we see the socialization of our nation's various markets through you know, a different way of using words, saying that we need to make sure that everybody is covered, everybody gets what they need. But this falls back to the Marxism. This falls back to from everybody what they're capable and to everybody what they need. Uh, the problem is, is that changes incentives in a government and in an economy. Instead of everybody working for what they can get and working for what they can afford, now you have people needing more instead of working hard. I would like to further say that back in the 20s and all the way through the 50s, Mises was on the losing side of the debate. Mises was seen as the loser. Nobody thought that prices were required for proper economic calculation. And in retrospect, 40 years later, when the Berlin Wall came down, we saw the repercussions of what a socialist system does to economies. At first glance, socialism seems like a great, fundamentally great idea. Everybody gets the best, everybody gets what they need, and it's only at a small cost. The, the marginal increase in taxes for the individual taxpayer to help provide for his fellow man. And while these concepts appear great on the surface, almost utopian, we see that further down the line, the unintended consequences that Mises so heavily fought against reared their ugly heads. When the Berlin Wall fell, we saw that communism was a farce. We saw that the socialization and the government intervention in markets where the consumers no longer paid for their services directly, 
Thank you very much. I'll get back to the answer. Appreciate it. <laughs> we found that communism and socialism has reared its ugly head. In the same way, you can see that social security, which appeared to be a phenomenal idea, and especially to those of growing growing age, those of you who are older, those who <laughs> those who need more from the system, really like this idea. And my friend here, Taryn, was talking about the, politi the politicis politicization of these markets. And what better example is there of socialism gone wrong than social security, where the older portion of the population is now voting more and more in favor of socialized systems because it disproportionately benefits them. And uh, to get to a, a more specific point, I'd like to say that this argument and this debate is not about the moral validity of socialism or the moral validity of universal health care. Everybody likes the idea. Everybody thinks it's a good idea to be able to provide for your fellow man and to be able to provide in a way that everybody has access. My personal qualm with the system is that while we may be providing short-term benefits to the population in terms of providing healthcare access for every person, we're actually creating long-term repercussions that we cannot see in the present day. I'd like to say that socialist systems have proven over time with social security, communism being the largest example, and even with the US Postal Service, you'll see that socialist systems where government intervention is the heaviest, you see long-term failure and long-term debt. And I'll take your question now, sir. So my question is really that you find a problem. Well, first, I'm kind of a little confused. At first you said that when the Berlin Wall fell, we saw the problem with socialism, even though I was more in line with the fact that the, the uh, USSR was more of a communist nation. So I'm, I'm trying to understand if you see the difference between socialism and communism. Because so you seem to be interchangeably using the word when they're not Communism the is, by extension, socialism taken to an extreme. Uh, is that uh, your definition of it? That would be my definition of it. And specifically with central planners and governments, socializing systems, in this case, healthcare or in communism's case, in Soviet Russia, uh, bread, or tanks, or milk. And all of those markets saw huge flaws, long lines waiting for products that never came. And to bring it back to another point, uh, how many of you would really like to wait at the DMV for your health care? <laughs> I would guess none of you. I mean, I'm sure they've got online appointments, but let's be real. The last time I set up an online appointment, I still had to wait an hour and a half. <laughs> Hello, my name is Albert Chang, and we are side dads for Universal Healthcare. Like my colleague Terrence said, the single payer system would help save money through reducing administration costs if we were under one system. If everybody's covered with the single payer system, it would be easier to process auto transactions that occur. This is what us economists call economies of scale. For example, we don't need to check the eligibility of each person, which creates administration costs. We just need, uh, if we are all in the system, we just need to check if they're dead or not. Another, single, another way single payer will reduce costs is by lowering the amount we spend on prescription, prescription drugs. Currently, we have a monopolistic private companies that controls the price of our medication. Why do, we, why do you think our medication prices are so high? For example, if you were to go buy uh, Celebrex, which is a commonly prescribed pain medication in, in Canada, it will cost an average of $51, but in the US, it costs $225. We have individual insurance, insurance groups, hospitals, stores that buy prescriptions for their consumers. These groups plan and negotiate their own prices with the pharmaceutical companies, resulting in an unregulated variety of prices. Through single payer system, we could create formulary and allow government to buy drugs for the entire country 
and give give us purchase, purchasing power and lower the drugs, uh, lower the cost of the drugs. Universal health care can also boost economic activity. As of 2011, about 59.5 percent of Americans were enjoying health insurance through their employer in the private sector. Private businesses can free up the fund used for health insurance for investment in other areas of their business. This could reduce employer labor costs by more than 12 percent. For example, in 2007, General Motors spent $4.6 billion on health care for its employees. If those companies had universal health care, they would save all that in health care costs and create more employment and investment. It makes, business, it makes businesses easier in the U.S. to compete on the international market. In Japan, Toyota enjoys economic benefits of universal health care because, I will answer your question afterwards, after I'm done. Because uh, of universal health care, Toyota's production costs are $1,400 lower per vehicle than the cost for American manufacturers. And that's just one company, one sector. Healthcare through employment causes job lock, causes job lock um, for job potential. In 2002 in California, 2.3% of the workforce with employment-based health coverage would have tried to make more productive, improving jobs if they did not feel constrained to their health insurance. Overall, the presence of job lock annually leads us to $772 million in foregone productivity gains. Job lock through healthcare also loses us potential entrepreneurship. Most individuals stay away from starting their own business due to fear of losing healthcare insurance they depend on from their employ uh, current employer. With universal healthcare in place, self-employment in the U.S. can increase by 2 to 3.5 percent. And healthier people also creates more economic pro productivity by being able to work. In 2003, an estimated eight, 18 million adults ages 19 to 64, 64 were not working and had a disability or chronic disease or were not working because of health reasons. 69 million workers reported missing days due to illness for a total of 407 million days of lost time at work. 55 million workers reported a time when they were unable to concentrate at work because of their own illness or that of a family member, family member accounting for another 478 million days. Health-related work losses are estimated to cost U.S. employers more than $260 billion each year and may, co and may cost some companies more than direct medical expenditures. Yes, Taylor. Um, so I was curious about your figures with regard to the costs for companies, specifically automotive companies. Yes. Um, those costs under universal health care, they don't simply disappear. They, they reappear and increase taxes. Um, and also, with regard to your figures on work days lost, um, is that to say that universal health care is going to get rid of people's illness? I'm saying universal health care would create more time at work, would create more productivity. And then for, uh, what was the, can you repeat the question one more time, please? Um, won't <coughs> costs, with regard to industries in specific, won't those costs be reflected in higher corporate tax rates? Higher corporate tax rates. Um, they would still get money from uh, investing in more employment in their, uh, in their sectors and companies and investments. Yeah. <laughs> Hello everybody. Um, thank you, Judge Griffin. Um, just to re reiterate, we the opposition believe that universal health care is not a system that should be enacted. And just as Taylor mentioned, uh, we can all agree that everyone deserves some form of health care, but the question still remains at what cost? Um, universal health care, uh, one thing that uh, these men over here just argued is that universal health care will help regulate prices so that people can pay less for it. Um, but one health care analyst does make a point that regulated prices prevent markets from forming um, efficiently and allocating resources efficiently, as well as leading to a pervasive shortage and deteriorating quality of health care, um, while stifling innovation and uh, diverting care to an equitable black market. Um, healthcare is a socialist system that, like most socialist concepts, has no intentions, but uh, they don't usually work out in the end. 
Uh, we can look at a country like Sweden as uh, evidence of these inefficient inefficiencies. According to Sweden, um, from 2006 to 2011, um, the number of people who purchased private health care plans doubled. Um, in 2006, 200, only 200,000 people had private health care plans, and just five years later, there was over 400,000. Um, these movement back to privatized health care is caused by problems like longer wait times and below our services that people who have the most health care have to deal with. Um, for example, so these issues do be go over to other countries like Canada, uh, which you guys also mentioned, those people who have universal health care. Um, in Canada, to see a specialist, the average wait time is 8.6 weeks. Versus here, to see a specialist, uh, most people only have to wait about two and a half weeks. Um, another example of an effectiveness um, in social, socialist programs is the United States Postal Service. Um, according to Forbes magazine, uh, since it cannot raise prices, our postal service is losing money every day. Uh, by ignoring market prices and slowly pushing this up on business. In fact, the Postal Service has decided that they have to close 3,700 locations and even consider suspending Saturday deliveries to come back in losses. Um, we can also look at the market for cosmetic healthcare services as evidence that it's more beneficial to leave healthcare services to the market to be um, Cosmetic services have been provided for many years without government regulations. Um, and we've seen that prices for these services has has gone down significantly. Um, for example, um, the price of a Botox inje injection in 2011 was about $365. Today, you can get a Botox injection for only $100. And if you wanted to get liposuction five years ago, it would cost you about $2,800. But today, you can get it for under $1,000. Um, if we leave all healthcare services to be manipulated by the markets, we will most likely see a fall in services and other procedures that will be more useful in saving people's lives. Another issue that the universal health care system will create is a lack of innovation. Um, as you guys mentioned, we do pay a lot of money here for health care service in the United States. In fact, it's 17% of our GDP goes towards providing health care service. In other countries, like Germany, France, and Sweden, they pay about 11% of their GDP. And even in the UK, they only spend 8% 8, 8 of their GDP goes towards health care. Uh, but um, to combat this, the reason why we are one of the most highest people paying for more healthcare is because we're the most leading innovators in healthcare so in the health healthcare sector. Most of our money is spent on medical technology. This is the reason why people in our healthcare uh, system are more willing to pay higher prices to have access to the innovation. Instituting universal healthcare will we'll inhibit the market from focus and allow these health higher prices to not exist in the world, even less funding for research and development. Without innovation, there will be no growth, and um, this will ine inevitably lead to, uh, this is not <laughs> lead to the destruction of our healthcare system. And most importantly, uh, with privatized healthcare, we can focus more on saving lives instead of saving money. Well, since Taylor's got to say this stuff, I want to point out that we're arguing that Universal healthcare can exist with private insurance. So people who who, pay, who has more money to pay for like more uh, better healthcare can do it. And then the second question is, you caught us out on regulating costs um, with the government, right? Well, then how can you stop the mono monopoly of uh, pharmaceutical and people who create technology uh, for for healthcare to charge us whatever they want to? Well, I mean, well, how can you, well, I mean, what you guys said was you won't want to be the one who will prescription costs, which would be great. But if uh, prescription costs, if just prescription costs are lowered, then, um, you know, as we know, it costs a lot of money to produce a medicine, right? And it's a lot of years of research and a lot of millions of dollars to produce a new medication. And so if we lower the prices, then how are we going to pay for that? People are going to be less incentivized to, um, Create new medicines to help people because they won't they won't get the money back. So my question to you would be, how would we combat that? We don't have to create. Uh, we don't have to lower the prices for the new, the new ones. We could lower for just like the basic ones that help us survive. We don't need innovation. So that's the one question. One question. Uh, oh, I can answer. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
you enjoy. <laughs> One of the points I want to talk about right now is this idea of the wait times that you said that we would have under universal health care. Well, I have a graph right here, so I'm not making it up. It's right here in front of you. It talks about same day or next day appointment, and it has the countries such as Germany, New Zealand, Netherlands, Australia, Sweden, France, Norway, the UK, uh, the United States and Canada. For the same day or next day appointment, it showed that 76% of people in Germany find that they can get the same day or next day appointment. Whereas Canada, oh, sorry, not Canada, I don't even know why I said that. The United States has 48% of people say that they can get next day or same day appointments. So I'm curious to see as why you think the wait times will be longer when you're just looking at one country specifically, which is Canada. You know, you can't take one country and how they run their system and you know paint the brush over all the rest, because we know that there are a ton of other nations that use a universal healthcare system, and they seem to be doing just fine with their wait times, according to my data here. Also, the ease of which getting after-hours care without going to the to the emergency room show that the UK show that 69% of the people say that they have it's easier for them to get after-hours care without going to the ER, and. Whereas the United States says we have 39% of people who said they have ease of going to the uh, getting after hours care without going to the ER. So I'm just not seeing where you're saying that longer wait times are actually going to occur in a universal health. Also, another point that I wanted to talk about here is your one of the things Taylor you said was it's not you know you're speaking kind of fast so I had to write quickly but it says the argument is not of moral validity but of access. The access to healthcare. And one of the problems that I have with what you're saying is right now, our system, the way we have it, has 40 million people who are uninsured. If the problem is access, then what you what you two are proposing is not going to make it any better. Case back, I mean, Taylor, yourself, you suffer from diabetes, if I'm correct. How are you supposed to be able to get access if you can't even go see a doctor? Let's say for some reason that you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have health insurance, but you need to go see the doctor to get the, you know, primary diagnosis for it. Wouldn't it be better for people to have just be able to go to the doctor to see if they even have such an illness? I'm just not seeing the point you two are making. Talking about how that's an access problem. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Bring that up, dude. <laughs> okay, so um, in the rebuttal to the affirmative, I, I want to bring up a few points. It wasn't an argument about access. Um, that was primarily one of your arguments was access and the ability to get these resources. Um, for me, it's it's more an argument of liberty and the allocation of resources. Okay, um, for me, my personal liberty is being endangered when my tax dollars are going to pay for somebody else's health care if I maintain a healthy H1C level and my blood sugar levels are normal and you know I get my prescriptions in the mail and I don't even need to go to the doctor. But I find it a personal affront to my liberty if I'm spending money for um, say a two pack a day smoker to get their health care. Um, also, with regards to after-hour care, um, I'm just wondering how many of you really want to go to the hospital after hours unless it's an emergency? How many of you are like, oh, I, I don't need to make an appointment, let me just go to the hospital after hours. <laughs> let me just go to the hospital after hours so I can see my doctor at 9 p.m. because I, I know you all want to be doctors who stay at the office from you know, opening until closing and then you decide you need to stay afterwards because that's, you know, a really efficient allocation of your time, okay? Uh, furthermore, I want to point out that it's not just my liberty that's being affronted, it's your liberty, okay? If you don't have any chronic illness, if you don't have any pre-existing condition and you're spending your money to care for me, that's money you could have be better spent on other resources. 
Okay. Um, and furthermore, I point out, you guys were talking a lot about cutting costs, but I just want to say that the costs for Medicare and Medicaid over the past century have risen at double the rates of inflation. Okay. Um, this is with government intervention. Um, prices have gone up. We are running a deficit for the Medi Medicare and Medicaid programs, which are, to a certain extent, the safety net you guys so long for. Um, and to bring it back to the Social Security, on the surface it appears great. You know, I'm gonna retire and I'm gonna be paid for the time I put in when I was younger. But the problem is we have a growing pool, and even if we're taking care of the elderly, if the elderly age and age and age and we increase their longevity, that's even a larger pool of people who are gonna be taking from the young. It's like burdening your children with what you're gonna need tomorrow instead yeah. of saving for it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanna say that you should all be concerned with your own liberty and with your own freedom from taxes and the incrimination that things like the Affordable Care Act put on you for not signing up for it. Okay, thank you. He added a new point of information into it, a new statistic. <laughs> no question. <laughs> okay, thank you.